Uh, Roses War was my very, very first book. Um, and it started off as a book about animal noises. Um, and it was very, very long and, in fact, very, very boring. And I showed it to my editor, Susan Hirschman, and she read through it and it started off, uh, this is the farmer, this is his dog that barks, this is his cow that moos, this is his horse that neighs, this is his cat that meows, and it went on and on and on. And there was one line in it that said, and this is the fox, he never makes a noise. And Susan, my editor, looked at that line and she said, I like that line, Pat. Why don't you just take the story away and think along that particular, those particular words, this is the fox, he never makes a noise. So the book that my story that started off with like hundreds of words eventually ended up um, with 32 words um, because I decided that I should treat the story almost like a silent film uh, so that they're not really, the fox isn't mentioned at all and um, so that the reader knows what's happening but um, poor Rosie, so totally innocent, has no idea what's happening so this is Rosie's walk Rosie the hen went for a walk across the yard around the pond over the haycock past the mill through the fence under the beehives and got back in time for dinner. The drawings, um, I was limited to three colours on the drawings, which gives it that patterned effect because I had to have a black line to work to. So the only colours I could use were yellow, red and black. So I was stuck with like oranges because if you mix the yellow and the red together, you can get the orange. And the yellow and the black, you could get the greens. And the, the black and the red, you could get the brown. So very limited. But that gave it that particular style to, to, to Rosie. Um, this book is called Changes, Changes. Um, I wanted to do a book about something changing. But I didn't want to do the butterfly caterpillar bit because it had been done so many times. And then uh, at that particular time, I, our son Morgan was four years old and he'd got a set of building bricks he used to play with so I'm afraid we sort of nicked them off him and uh, with a lot of help from my husband um, we tried to make uh, lots of machines and houses and whatever we could out of these same blocks so there's no cheating it's using exactly the same amount of blocks I wanted to start off with a house um, oh, this is the boat we made from the same amount, no cheating. And the house. And a, a, a lorry. So we start off with, th those are the bricks. And they start building. And they build a house, but the house catches fire. So I have to dismantle it and start to build. Now hopefully the child can see what's happening here. They build a boat, sail away, no more water. So they dismantle the boat, start building. Build a lorry, off they go. And then the lorry breaks down. So they dismantle the lorry, start building. Build a train engine. And they reach the end of the line. So they start building and build another house. That's the end. And that's the that's book that the children can read themselves and read into it. 
this is a book called One Hunter. And when I, I always do lots of roughs before I start on the finished drawings. And I did it all very painterly. Um, but then I decided it's a counting book. So it has to be patterns so that the, a small child can actually read out the patterns. So it can go like one, two, three. They're very specific patterns. I tried doing it in cut-out paper. And I ended up with more paper on me than, than on the board. So I gave that idea up. And um, oh, there's another version that I was trying to get there to get those patterns, but th even that didn't work. So I went back to my uh, three colours again with the outline, which makes patterns. So there's one hunter, one, two elephants, one, two, three giraffes. So they're patterns that the small child can pick out, not confusing them with a lot of detail, four ostriches. And then I put little clues in so that the, the, the reader can try and guess what's coming up. So it's uh, five antelopes in here, little clues, little stripes there. Six tigers, more clues here. Seven crocodiles, tails coming in. Eight monkeys, more clues. Nine snakes, ten parrots, and then we go reverse. Ten parrots, nine snakes, eight monkeys, seven crocodiles, six tigers, five antelopes, four ostriches, three giraffes, two elephants, and they're all chasing him, and one hunter, and he's being chased off by all the animals. Ah, I had an idea for, uh, I wanted to do a story about a tree growing in a forest and then it rejuvenates itself. Um, so I, I took the idea to my publisher and showed it to her. And th these are just scribbles, which I would do before I even started on a proper, uh, what we call mock-up, a pretend book. And I've got here, there's a tree growing in the forest. Um... The deer nibble the young leaves on the tree. And that's something else coming in. Um, the bird builds his nest in the tree. The spider spins its web in the tree. The squirrel hunts for nuts in the tree. Each time there's something else coming in. And the tree's growing all the time. And here, there's a little shoot that's growing. It gets bigger and bigger on each page. Uh, and the mole comes and digs under the tree. And if and the rabbit comes and builds under the tree. And all the while this is growing. Um, and the fox makes his lair under the tree. And that meanwhile it's growing. But then some men come with saws. And they chop the tree down. And all the animals that were in that tree moved back. Um, oops, head back again. So that's cut down. But there's another one growing there. And the, the animals have started to move into that one. Now, my editor saw that. Um, and she said, Pat, it's, it's, it's really sad that they've chopped the tree down when you're doing a book about growth. And she was quite right. And actually now, if I'd done the book now... I probably would have had a family living in the in 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 the woods who perhaps would have built a house out of the tree that they chopped down because it seems a bit brutal to chop the tree down for no reason. But if I were to do it now, I would have them building a their own house and the other trees, the, the saplings grown up and they're all moved back. Anyway, so that was discarded. But as my editor said, um, no ideas are ever wasted because from that I got the idea for. Good night, Owl. And this again is about the bees buzzed, buzz, buzz, and I'll try to sleep. The squirrel crack nuts, crunch, crunch, and I'll try to sleep. The crows croaked, caw, caw, and I'll try to sleep. The woodpecker pecked, rat a tat, rat a tat, and I'll try to sleep. 
And also uh, from that same idea about the tree uh, came Titch, because that's about growth. Um, and Titch has the tiny seed that grows and grows and grows. So it's all about growth. So from that idea that I didn't use, I got two books out of it. This one's called The Doorbell Rang. And yes, <laughs> uh, this, this, this one I, I wrote just before, well, I had the idea of just before Christmas because in England we have a day called Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas. And you tend to invite parents around if you've got, if you're lucky enough to have them, they come around. Um, and it started off with my mum was staying with us and another friend's um, mother was staying with him. So we invited them around for Boxing Day lunch. And our next door neighbour's mum was living with them. So they, they all came. And um, it's, we ended up, and my husband kept inviting lots and lots. He said, oh, uh, Sylvia and Peter's parents are staying with them over Christmas. So I invited them for Boxing Day. So it ended up with, um, I think we had to get the tables out of the garden. There were about 20 people there for Boxing Day. And anyway, I've made some cookies for tea, said Ma. Good, said Victoria and Sam. We're starving. Share them between yourselves, said Ma. I made plenty. That's six each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as Grandma, said Victoria. They smell as good as Grandma, said Sam. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Tom and Hannah from next door. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's three each, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma's, said Tom. And look as good, said Hannah. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Peter and his little brother. Come in, said Ma, you can share the cookies. That's two each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as, gran as your Grandma's, said Peter, and smell as good. Nobody makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Joe and Simon with their four cousins. Come in, said Ma, you can share the cookies. That's one each, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma, said Joy, and look as good, said Simon, sorry. No one makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. And rang. Oh dear, said Ma, as the children stared at the cookies on their plates. Perhaps you'd better eat them quickly before we open the door. We'll wait, said Sam. It was Grandma with an enormous tray of cookies. How nice to have so many friends to share them with, said Grandma. It's a good thing I made a lot. And no one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. I wanted that to have sort of a, a circular feel, so with the, the doorbell ringing at the end that you could feel it's going to happen all over again and there'd be even more and more people um, turning up. <laughs> uh, I decided that I wanted to do a book about monsters. Uh, and again, I, as I said, I like to do, I do loads and loads of roughs before I actually s settle on the type of finished drawing I want to do because it's, the, 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 the drawing has to fit the, the story. And um, I started off with a black outline, and they began to look uh, really scary. And although th these are monsters, they're nice monsters, and I wanted it to be a, a reassuring book, not a, not a scary, scary book. So I tried lots of different ways, and I thought, no, I can't, I can't use um, ink outlines, and I don't want to use really thick paint because it, it just makes them too scary. Um, so I decided to use very soft watercolour and that way it sort of softens them. Um, oh, and this story 
uh, my niece Amy was, I guess she was about four, and her mum was expecting uh, another baby. And I said, watch it, stupidly, I said, what are you going to do with the new baby when it arrives? And uh, she said, uh, I'm going to give it away. So I thought it'd be nice to do a book about someone giving their baby brother or sister away. Um, but then I didn't think it was very funny for a real child to give their baby brother or sister away. So I thought, well, they, they have to be monsters. So um, turn, turn, turned the main character into a monster. When Billy Monster was born, his pa said, my son is going to grow up to be the worst monster in the world. No, he's not, said Hazel, Billy's sister. I am, but nobody heard Hazel. When Grandma and Grandpa came to visit the baby, Grandpa said, Look at those strong fangs. He can bend bars with his teeth. So can I, said Hazel. But they're all so busy watching Billy that nobody watched Hazel. Listen to that noise, said Grandma. He can growl already. I can growl louder than that, said Hazel. But they were all so busy listening to Billy that nobody listened to Hazel. Look, said Pa, see how he swings on the curtains. I can do that, said Hazel. But they were all so busy looking at Billy that nobody looked at Hazel. See how he scares the postman, said Ma. So do I, said Hazel. But they're all so busy admiring Billy that nobody noticed Hazel. Ma and Pa thought Billy was such a bad baby that they entered him into the worst monster baby in the world competition. Hazel hoped that the baby who tried to eat the prize would win. But then Billy tried to eat the judge. This is definitely the worst monster baby in the world, said the judge. And Billy won. Ma and Pa and Grandma and Grandpa were very proud of Billy. I know that he will grow up to be the worst monster in the world, said Pa happily. No, he won't, said Hazel. But nobody heard Hazel. Hazel tried losing her little brother, but he kept turning up again. She tried frightening him away, but that didn't work either, so she gave him away. Where's Billy? asked Ma and Pa. I gave him away, said Hazel. Oh, cried Ma and Pa, you gave your own baby brother away. You must be the worst monster in the world. I told you I was, said Hazel. I'm the worst monster in the world and he's the worst baby monster in the world. I thought you'd given him away, said Ma. I did, said Hazel, but they gave him back. Ah, now, <laughs> this is a story I wrote about a, a naughty child. And again, my editor showed it to Susan. Um, well, I'll read it to you. Where's the baby, Grandma cried. In the garden, Mother replied, making a mess, said Morgan. And then it continues that um, they, they rush into a room and uh, the mixture for the chocolate cake that Mother was about to bake was heaped on the table and thrown on the floor and stuck to the fingerprints on the door. He's walking early, said Grandma. Oh dear, said Mother in alarm, grabbing hold of Father's arm, he's gone. But Morgan noticed on the floor footprints in the corridor. They lead to the kitchen, Morgan. They followed the fingerprints on the wall to father's workroom in the hall. They opened the door and they all peered in. Thick paint oozed from an open tin. It trickled and dripped all over past tools and lay on the floor in glossy pools. He's taken a brush, sighed father. Now, when Susan saw that, she actually said, we can't publish that because that child should have been drowned at birth, is her actual words. So I then, I left it for a while, and then years later, and I don't think Susan's realised it to this day, so it's the same story, but I've, I've used monsters because monsters are supposed to behave 
badly. So uh, to continue the story, Hazel opened the door and they all peered in. How clever, said Grandma. He's opened a tin. Paint trickled and dripped all over Pa's tools and lay on the floor in glossy pools. He's taken a brush, said Hazel. The wall from the workroom was striped in red. It stops at the living room, Hazel said. He's good at painting, said Grandma. What a help, Grandma said. What a lot he can do. He's been cleaning the living room chimney for you. The new white carpet was not so white and fingerprints as black as night covered the sofa and both the chairs circled the walls. Then went upstairs. He's a good little climber, said Grandma. They followed Hazel who raced ahead. Into the bathroom the fingerprints led. How smart, Grandma cried, to turn on the cold faucet. He must know blue is cold and the red one is hot. Talcum powder was thick on the floor and little white footprints went out of the door. Ma and Pa's bedroom door was ajar. I'm sure I closed it this morning, said Ma. He must have opened it on his own. I keep forgetting how much he's grown. He's tall for his age, said Grandma. The dress Ma was making was shorter than planned. He can use scissors, said Grandma. Isn't that grand? The scarf Ma was knitting for Uncle Fred had been unravelled all over the bed, wiggled and curved around the floor, and they followed the wiggles out of the door. Oh dear, said Ma, where can he be? Don't worry, said Grandma cheerfully. I'm sure that we will find him soon. He's probably tidying Hazel's room. All Hazel's books had been pulled from the shelf. He must have been trying to read them himself, said Grandma. And look how he tried to write on the wall. It's hard to believe he's a baby at all. There was one room left. So they tiptoed in. A tiny room as neat as a pin. Not a toy out of place or a mark on the wall. He can't have been in here at all, said Ma. It's far too clean. But she hadn't seen what Hazel had seen. Oh, cried Grandma, isn't he sweet? Yes, said Hazel, when he's asleep. He does sleep soundly, said Grandma. Uh, this book, you know, people ask, always ask me where I get ideas for stories. Well, this um, particular book called Shrinking Mouse, uh, actually the idea came from um, an art bag. Uh, I was travelling back from Yorkshire. I live in London and I had a, a, quite a big art bag with me. <laughs> quite a big art bag with me. Um, and uh, I thought I'd put it on the rack above my seat. But when I got into London, it wasn't there. So I thought, well, maybe I'd put it behind the seat. So I started looking. Everyone's getting off the train at this point. And I'm still looking. And then at the end, there's just one chap at the far end of, of the, the corridor of the train. And uh, he said, uh, have you lost something? I said, well, yes, I had a, an art bag. I thought I'd put it on the rack uh, above me, but it's not there. And he said, well, there's, there's, there's a bag at this end. And I looked at it and said, no, my, my bag was much bigger than that. And he said, well, look, it's the only bag, you know, that, that I can see on, on in, the car in the carriage. So I thought, he was being so nice, I thought I should be polite and walk up to where it was. And as I walked up to it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I realised, you know, I'm supposed to be an illustrator and my sense of perspective is useless. And as I and I re of course it was my bag. It, and what had happened? It had slid all the way as people got off the train, took their luggage with them. It had slid all the way down to the end of the um, coach. Uh, but anyway, I did feel a bit stupid. But then it gave me an idea for a story called Shrinking Mouse, and uh, you would uh, you will realise why this black bag gave me the idea when I read it to you. Fox, rabbit, squirrel and mouse were sitting at the edge of their wood, looking across the fields. 
Look at that tiny wood over there, said Mouse. It's even smaller than I am. And look, there's Owl flying towards it. Oh dear, said Fox. He's shrinking. I'll go and tell him to come back before he disappears altogether. And Fox set out after Owl. Oh dear, cried Rabbit. Fox is shrinking too. I'll go and tell him to come back before he disappears like Owl. And Rabbit set off after Fox. Oh dear, said Squirrel. Rabbit is shrinking too. I'll go and tell him to come back before he disappears like Fox. And Squirrel set off after Rabbit. Poor Mouse was very upset. Squirrel is shrinking as well, he thought. I must try and stop him before he disappears like the rest of my friends. And Mouse scampered after Squirrel. The wood is getting bigger, thought Mouse. I must be shrinking too. Poor Mouse didn't want to be any smaller, but he kept on running. The wood is really big now, thought Mouse. I must have nearly disappeared. Mouse didn't want to disappear, but he kept on running. And when he got to the wood, there were Owl and his friends. Have I disappeared? asked Mouse. No, they said. You're just the right size. Good, said Mouse. Let's go home. But when he turned to look at their wood, it was very, very small. Oh, Mouse cried. Our wood has shrunk. We can't go back. Follow me, said Owl. So they did. And as they got closer to their wood, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Are we getting smaller, asked Mouse. No, said Owl, as they reached their wood. We're all just the right size. And he flew away. Oh dear, said Fox, Owl is shrinking again. Don't worry, said Mouse. I'm sure he'll be the right size when he comes back. And he was. The next book is a book called Ten Red Apples. And uh, again, this is a counting book. Uh, and I decided uh, to use, again, the patterns, because it is a counting book, and a limited colour range so that it's easy to pick out the uh, patterns on it. So go one, two, three, all very stylized and to keep it patternfully. So, ten red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly dee. Horse came and ate one, chomp, chomp, chomp. Nay, nay, fiddly fee. Horse, cried the farmer, save some for me. Nine red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Cow came and ate one, munch, munch, munch. Moo, moo, fiddly fee. Cow, cried the farmer, save some for me. Eight red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Donkey came and ate one. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Hee haw, fiddly fee. Donkey cried the farmer, save some for me. Seven red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Goat came and ate one. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Moo, moo, fiddly fee. Goat cried the farmer, save some for me. Six red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Pig came and ate one. Snort, snort, snort. Oink, oink, fiddly fee. Pig cried the farmer, save some for me. Five red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Sheep came and ate. Nibble, nibble, nibble. Ba, ba, fiddly fee. Sheep cried the farmer, save some for me. Four red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Goose came and ate one. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Hiss, hiss, fiddly fee. Goose cried the farmer, save some for me. Three red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Duck came and ate one. Pick, 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 whack, whack, fiddly fee. Duck cried the farmer, save some for me. Two red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Hen came and ate one. Peck, peck, peck. Cluck, cluck, fiddly fee. Hen cried the farmer, save one for me. One red apple hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Good, said the farmer, you saved one for me. Yippee, fiddly fee. 
No red apples hanging on the tree. My, my, fiddly fee. No red apples to bake in a pie. Fie, fie, fiddly fee. Look, cried the farmer, another apple tree. More red apples hanging on the tree. Yippee, fiddly fee. Good, cried the farmer's wife. You saved them for me. Yippee, fiddly fee. Uh, this is my latest book, and I've been asked um, many, many times to do a sequel to Rosie, and I've resisted it. Uh, but then um, this editor, Anne McNeil, um, approached me, and she, she got me thinking about it again. I didn't want to do another story about Rosie, uh, because she's been, you know, she's told her story. But then I thought, well, what if she lays an egg? Um, that might be quite nice for her to lay an egg, which would probably make her the oldest hen in the world ever to have <laughs> laid an egg. <laughs> well, she would have been certainly over 45. Never mind. Where, oh, where is Rosie's chick? Hooray! Rosie the hen has laid an egg, and at last her egg is hatching. Oh no, where is little baby chick? And here's a pussy cat. Rosie looked under the hen house. But little baby chick wasn't there. She looked in the basket, but little baby chick wasn't there either. She looked behind the wheelbarrow, but little baby chick wasn't there either. She looked across the fields, but she still couldn't find little baby chick. She looked through the straw, but little baby chick wasn't there either. Where, oh, where is little baby chick? Behind you! Then Rosie and her little baby chick went for a walk. The end. And while Rosie had been looking for her chick, the fox had been looking for her little cub. And they all shout, behind you. That's when Fox finds a little cup as well. So the reader thinks that the fox has been chasing um, the little chick, but she's mm. actually looking for her cup. Well, I hope that the children who, who read my books or have them read to them enjoy them as much as I enjoyed writing the stories and doing the pictures. Mm.